my dad said to me, why did you pick that puppy? Because Mediterranean Blue had a bit of white on his chest and he had actually, he had big feet, but okay. because I bred him himself and he was the only one he could get over the whelping board. And every morning, every dinner, he would be there. He wanted to be with me. So huh. I thought, well, if you like me that much, it's your best day. <laughs> Guys, I've got somebody back who um, I've had on before, and he's a super interesting person. I really enjoy our chats together, Dave. Um, you're always interesting. You are a four-time IGL winner, which is pretty um, spectacular, and you're also the team captain for England for the Game Fair. You're a legend in the, uh, the gundog world, and uh, I appreciate you taking some time to sit here today and uh, talk a little bit about dogs. Yeah, no problem. Good, good to yeah. see you again, Robert. <laughs> always, always a pleasure. I always enjoy our chats. I always love the British wit and uh, and the yeah. charm. And uh, you're 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 amazing to watch. I've seen you. I'm not a I'm not a gun dog person. I've become one because of my wife. Um, she has a um, a puppy off of one of your dogs, and I've I've learned a lot. And I've really enjoyed watching um, the IGL because it's such an interesting procedure it's it's almost like a there's so much so much charisma around it the way it works you're outside in these huge beautiful rolling estates it's yeah. it's, it's absolutely beautiful tell me a little bit about it like i mean for people who have never seen it um i know there's some like paul french has the videos where you can watch it but it is so it's literally like watching a movie watching this because it's, yeah. it's like nothing i've ever seen in dog training and dog sports Tell me, um, Dave, a little bit about like from the minute you get your dog out of the of the trailer and you get to that line and then you you're walking this line with many other dogs. Walk me through that. What's going on? Yeah, I mean, you, you're quite right. The the IGL is, is unique, and it's it's even in England, it's not like any other trial. There's a, a normal trial. You'd be twenty four competitors you know, six or eight guns, a few helpers, a few beaters, a few judges, so you maybe 40 people. And you get, well, then you get to the IGL and there's car after car after car after car going on the car park and everybody's watching you, everybody's filming, everyone's tense and there's three, maybe three or 400 people there, which is, when you think about it, so difficult for the gamekeepers to keep try and keep people quiet, keep birds in the right place to, to produce it enough birds for, for nearly 70 dogs this year. It was amazing, really. Wow. You know, the first day, two retrieves apiece, you know, mm -hmm. 140 birds just for the first round, if everyone was lucky enough. So it, it is, it's, uh, I think you, your first time you go to the IGL is, is such an amazing feeling. Mm -hmm. And that's what I always say to people, once you've been once, you'll be hooked for the rest of your life because you want it. You know, you, mm -hmm. you desperately need it. Once, you, once you've felt that excitement, you know, preparing yourself all your clothes everything for three days you know a day before yeah. getting there probably the day training on the way to there so it's a, it's a week's event really mm -hmm. and then that's then you're crossing your fingers hope you get a good run of birds because <laughs> you know that, that's the thing you don't know what you're going to get yeah at any time the luck of the draw right i mean it doesn't you may get you may get a, a duck or a pheasant or you may get a quail right well, yeah, we, we don't really have the quails, but I mean, it was like Rocky's first, one of Rocky's first retrieves. Mm -hmm. The first round, we tried basically to take a retrieve off your own guns, which mm -hmm. theoretically is big 30, 40, 50 yards, you know. And then on the latter rounds, then you, you, you stretch from one side of the line to other. But a partridge had gone on and towered over this fence on the other side of the valley. So mm -hmm. my first retrieve was second dog down on a running partridge. At probably 200 <laughs> yards. Wow. You know, so I thought, Christ, I'm going to be out before I start. But, right. you know, luckily, <laughs> enough, he, he made a bloody good job. He looked smart, to be honest with you. You know, mm -hmm. got across there in one cast, and the bird had just dropped in like a, a very small valley within a big valley. Mm -hmm. So I, I got him in there. I, I saw him. He could, the beautiful thing with Rocky is when his, when his tail goes, you can read him like a book. Some dogs are hard to read, aren't they? When they're touching mm -hmm. scent and touching game. But once he does that, then you put your whistle away and let him get on with his job, like you know. So, so my first tree was 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 quite a good one with Rocky. 
So, so how much of it is handling versus how much of it is letting the dog do his job or her job? Yeah, good question. Good question. And, and the thing is, is when to step in and when not to step in, when to right. trust your dog, when not to trust your dog. You know, and I think a dog should be able to take them early trees if, if it's markable and do it on his own. And that's mm-hmm. one thing older I get and longer I get into my career, I like my dogs to be a little bit more natural. You know, I think there's too many of the one handlers today, what I call two pit poppy, you know, dog dead, go past the bird by a yard, <laughs> stepping in and, mm-hmm. you know, he's going to do that on his own. But then, of course, there comes a point where a good team, and that's when the handler steps in. You know, before he goes over a brow, before he goes out of sight, is he touching scent? Is he on live birds? Are you going to trust him and let him go out of the area? You know? Right. The same as the thing like Bailey, when Bailey won the championship, when I let him go on the runner. I mean, one or two people said to me, how did you let him go? But I knew the dog like like back to front. Uh-huh. Once he touched the scent, I thought he's on a, he's on a wounded bird. He's not, he's not coursing game. Mm-hmm. And that's, but that's a, it's a split second decision you have to make. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you get it wrong. <laughs> that separates the men from the boys, right? <laughs> well, it certainly does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, are you judged on, like, do you have to handle a dog? Like, or can the dog just on his own freely go get the game, bring it back, and that's it without handling? Yeah, I mean, theoretically, you could just say to your dog, go back, and each retrieve, mm-hmm. and he goes and picks it and comes back, and you could win. Just like uh, without ever handling. Yeah, theoretically, yeah. If you got, if you got say, say you got 11 marked retrieves, mm-hmm. which is theoretically possible, Sure. But obviously, if you if you don't, then that's when you need to handle your dog. If they shot three or four birds, mm-hmm. I think this year's championship there was a, a lot of handling because of how the game came. Because mm-hmm. the game was like came in little flushes. It was six or seven birds shot at a time. Sometimes you like I never had one mark retrieve in three mm-hmm. days. So you came mm-hmm. in. You you basically taking. Um, your information off the judges they say there's a bird here, there's a bird here. So there's right. a lot of handling, a lot of blind retrieves. Right. And, and and explain the blind retrieve. I mean, I know what it is, but a lot of people don't know what that means. A blind retrieve is where you, you come in and you, you've not seen it shot. So you have no idea where the bird is. The dog's not seen it. Like you, you may have come into line and you'd have been like in, in the crowd 10 minutes ago so they, and they've got several birds now. So the judge will give you as good as an area as he can. Okay. And, and to be fair, it was, it, it was quite difficult. You know, the, these birds were sky high up, up, off the top of these mountains in Scotland this year. Right. But the shooting was fantastic, you know. And because that they do the best trying, no one's perfect, they can't mark the exact area. And sure. I don't think the judges like to give you an exact area. At the end of the day, they want to see your dog work a bit and do it naturally, you know. Right. So, so a blind is where you, you, all you're doing is going off where a judge has told you. Then you have to send your dog, stop him, hold him in the area, maybe 50 yards away, maybe 200 yards away, over fences, over rivers, over dikes, you know. And so you don't even know where the bird is on a blind? Oh, not until you've been told. Right, right. But I'm saying you you don't know where. In other words, in America, in the field, in the uh, in the AKC hunt test, there's a certain area. The blind is always in that area, and they'll always oh, send the dog to that. Okay, so you're. It could be for one person. It could be a hundred yards this way. Another person could be a hundred yards the other way. It's yeah, well, that that's the thing. Fell. Exactly. With the walk up trial, you're taking on different terrain all the time. You're on the move. So, I mean, I think that that's why I love walk up trialing as opposed to driven trialing mm-hmm. every step's different every 20 yards is different you might get one over a wall over a fence you might get one land in the open on the flat you might be lucky so <laughs> yeah. you know and how far from, f- for those walk up for the walk up trial how far are you walking so you'll have 50 60 80 people with their dogs all the dogs are out at the same time right all the dogs are out, but only four are competing in line. Right, right. So oh, okay. So four are in the front competing. Exactly. But yeah. but you'll have you can have 50, 60, 70 dogs behind you off leash, working in theory, ready to work. Well, the, the dogs one are not competing. Will be on the lead. Oh, they are. The okay. dogs, 
Yeah, they have it with the dog, Stuart. So you'd have, let's pretend we just started. You'd have one, two, three, and four. Mm-hmm. Then you'd have a team of guns. So you'd be spread equally in between a team of eight guns and your judges. Okay. And then your, your cameramen at the IGL. Then then you'd have your, your, your number board helpers, your, your, your game carriers. So there could be 70 people in line at the IGL. Wow. You know, it wow. is, yeah. And then 300 people on the side. And then you've got your dog in a valley. 200 yep. yards away and he's going to pick you out. You know, <laughs> quite, quite amazing, really, what, what, what they can do. Now, you've got, how many have you competed? I know you won four. How many have you competed in? Oh, I, I gels. I yes. I think I've been, to, I've been to 25 different IGLs now. And the yeah. first one you ever went to, what was it like? Like when you first, you've, you probably went and observed it, but then when you first competed, was it, Exciting? Were you happy, or were you just nervous as, as, as a hill of beans? It was like like a kid at Christmas. It was amazing. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. Because I went probably ten years on the trot, just watching as a competitor, uh-huh. uh, okay. as, as, a, as a spectator. Sorry, you know. And so I went to a lot of championships. So I knew knew the format, but the first one I went to, like, I was awesome. You know, wow. the buzz you get, like, you know, and it's everything. You got nerves. You've got yeah. a, a lifetime's ambition to get there. Is it going to go sure. right? Are you going to make yourself look a fool? Yeah. <laughs> right. There's a lot, of, a lot of ups and downs. Now this year for 2023 or 2024, this this last season, you went with yeah. five dogs. Your, yourself and your girlfriend. You had three, and, and your girlfriend had two. Yeah, from the kennel we had five. I, I qualified three. Uh, five three. Louise qualified two. Yeah, so. Yeah, so a good achievement. It's the first time I've ever qualified three. Wow. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Now, you trained all of those dogs and qualified yeah. with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I tra- trained them all. And oh. Louise, the same, like, you know. And like, like Louise's dog, the old dog, Andy, who was originally my yeah. dog, I think he, he qualified. I think someone will pull me up if I'm wrong on this, but I think he's the only dog that's qualified with three different handlers, which is wow. quite, you know. Quite unique for a dog. Now, how old is, that's Nettlebray Andy, right? Of Fenderwood. Yeah, he, was, he was the oldest dog in the championship. He was nine and a half. Wow. Yeah, I qualified him. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Mr. Freaking bought him. And then his handler at the time uh, qualified with him. And then he he retired and Louise took over and she qualified with him. So for, for me, for a dog to be able to get to that, that pinnacle, that level, Mm-hmm. And, and perform well like you did at the championship, you know it's quite amazing, really. Yeah, for sure, that's that's spectacular. Mm-hmm. Especially, in that, I mean, do you often see dogs that old in competing, nine years old? No, not that very. And to be honest with you, there's no reason why that dog can't go again. He's as fit as a fiddle, you know. Wow. It, 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 it's, it is quite. His, his, his body language is the same. He wants it, you know. Yeah, yeah there's no no reason why he can't go again. What do you think the common age usually is for dogs in competition? Would it be like in like other sports, like five, six years old is usually the age that they're competing at? Uh, yeah, I think I think around five, they're probably the, at the best. Mm-hmm. Uh, the average dog is, you know, it, it, it takes you two years to, to train him, mm-hmm. and then he, he needs some experience. And I think right. when he gets to about five, is about peaking. Then, then I think like older people, sometimes he starts to know a little bit more than they should know. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> or not enough. <laughs> just exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Let me, I've got a, 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 here's an interesting question. There's two kinds of trainers. When I look in the competitive field, like in, in uh, the protection dog sports or in the obedience sports and other things, I find there's two kinds of people. There's the people who get a puppy and raise that puppy from eight weeks old until they, until the dog dies and they train it, raise it, compete with it and whatever. And there's the people who get the dog, that they can kind of check it out. Like my friend, Frank, who does the, the protection work, he'll only, only ever buy a one-year-old dog because he wants to know about the conformation of the dog. He wants to know that the dog has the nerves to do the sport. What's your yeah. thought on that? Like, how do you, where do you fall in that? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting question. I personally, I, I, I like my dogs at eight weeks. Oh, you do? Okay. I, yeah, I like, I like them as a puppy. I like to go pick it myself and it, and I'll, I'll, I'll want it to grow up in my environment. Yep. Yeah. And that's how I feel too. I'm with you on that. Yeah. What, what yeah, do you I'll, look for in that puppy? Like when you're, 
when you're looking for a puppy that's going to be a prospect to be, you know, a, a, a Dave Latham dog, what are your what are you looking for in one looks and two in the temperament and the drive of that dog that you're going to take to the IGL? Yeah, I think firstly I, I look for ov- obvious faults, like like its mouth. You know, is, is it overshot or is it undershot? Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, I look at his legs. Has, has it got Queen Anne legs? Has it, has it got nice straight legs? You know, mm-hmm. are, are his paws nice? Has it, has it got nice tight pads? You know, mm-hmm. obviously a dog, a dog working in brambles and heavy cover, you, you want nice tight feet. Or has he got big sp- splayed feet? Mm-hmm. So, firstly, I would eliminate anything what I don't like. Then, then I'd have a look at his tail action, throw him a tennis ball, play with him. One that wants to come with me, one that seems happy. But it is very difficult if you, if you haven't reared the puppies yourself because, you know, they can be, he can go and he's a bit sleepy, you know, he just woke up or, you know, that's right. sound. And they, they do vary a little bit. So, you know, yeah, I go and pick a pup or go a couple of times and have a look. You would always go a couple of times because you don't know the first day you can't really decide, right? No, exactly. Yeah. 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 But when, when, uh, when uh, I bred Mediterranean Blues litter, I was, I was just talking to you about uh, yep. a litter of is that we have coming off him soon and it's quite funny actually because me me dad said to me why did you pick that puppy because better training blue had a bit of white on his chest and he had actually he had big feet but okay because i've read him himself and he was the only one he could get over the whelping board and every morning every dinner he would be there he wanted to be with me Huh. So I thought, well, if you like me that much, it's your best day. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. You know, then that'll be a good and so mm-hmm. that goes a little against what I've actually just said, but uh, there you go. <laughs> Do you look at anything like in their temperament, like like in sharpness, like if the dog is too, if the dog is, and probably the dogs are, that you're breeding or seeing or probably don't have it, but if they're super nervy towards loud noises or other environments, do you look for that a lot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, some some pups are a little bit shy, but mm-hmm. I think that's the beauty of of um, having having a puppy from a, from a family. Mm-hmm. You know, as opposed to some that just you go around to some pups and they've never seen nothing. They've been in a shed, and mm-hmm. that, I think them are the puppies that can be nervy. I think a puppy that's been brought. I mean, when I the, the, when I had a litter of pups at home, there's been that many people there. And, you know, everybody wants to see the puppies. People coming around. The, the, right. the nerve are not there because they've been socialized so well as youngsters. Yep. I think that's quite important early on. I agree with that 100%. I love, I mean, and I think in Europe, you see more of that. I'm in the process of looking for a dog myself, and I talked to a good friend of mine as a breeder. He said, God, in Europe, the breeding is so much better because it's families doing it. It's not somebody doing Ooh. it in their backyard or in a facility or, you know, in a, a whatever. So. I like I like the, the, that you say that. So when you start with the puppy, what are your early things? Because the one thing I got to say, and I say this only to a few people, I love watching you with your dog. It just looks very natural. There's no, there's nothing contrived about your dog. Looks happy. He looks happy to be with you, and he looks happy to work with you. What? How do you develop that from puppyhood into you know adolescence and adulthood? What what kind of games do you play? What kind of training do you do? Yeah, I think it, it's very important that a Labrador should enjoy his work, mm-hmm. you know, and that, I mean, a lot of people say that to me and, and a lot of comments this year from the championship, our, our, our people said exactly what you just said, oh, I love to see your dogs are happy, they're wagging their tail, mm-hmm. you know, they're not, they're not under pressure, but I think it all comes through your training. If your training is pure, simple and basic, that, 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 that produces the confidence in the puppy. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I, the, the, I, I, like I always tell people, a puppy's not a puppy's not born to sit and stay, is it? That's mm-hmm. alien to a puppy. A puppy's born to run, chase, pee yeah. and poo, and have fun. You know, not to do what, what we want. So yeah. we're actually, if you're not careful, we, we suppress them so much. And when you when you're good trainers, or keep them happy, keep keep that tail wagging, keep them flowing. You know, keep that enthusiasm there. That, that, yeah. That's what you're looking. For. I mean. What the dog wants to do it, you want to do it, and you're working together. Yeah, not not being forced to do a job he doesn't really want to do. And you know that's such a ref- that's such a refreshing thing to hear you say, especially coming from where you are in the game, because so much in training, and this is something that's just 
pisses me off so much. So much of about, about training nowadays is about suppression, right? It's about mm -hmm. capping the drive. It's about squashing the dog. It's about the, slow down, stop this, stop this, stop this. And if you're going to do that, why even train a dog? Yeah, right? Why even breed them? And I see that a lot in, 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 in everything, in all kinds of training. And they're just, I, and with a lot of dogs, like when you have aggressive dogs, those dogs end up really aggressive because they're nerve bags at the end. You know, yeah. they're just so they're crazy yeah. nervy. And it's something that, you know, we never did with Dwayne. Dwayne, you know, I mean, Janet's very playful, very engaging with him. He is the most solid temperamented dog that I've seen in years. And, and it's all because of that. It's, it's keep it fun and keep the dog being a dog, yeah. right? And work with that. Yeah, quite, quite agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's how, so, how when you so you you make everything look easy obviously because because that's who you are but is there any kind of secret to i mean obviously there's got to be times in the training when the dog's not listening to you he's not sitting on the whistle he's not going where you're casting him and stuff like that um obviously there is structure and corrections and guidance in your training how do you pair that with your relationship with the dog to keep the dog looking like your dog's look yeah, yeah. Again, uh, interesting. I mean, a lot of people say, 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 you know, how 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 do you get your dog to spin on the whistle mm -hmm. and, and and wag its tail? Because you, you see a lot of the dogs they're doing exactly as they're told, but the the, the robots they're under right. pressure. You know, yeah, they've, they've got a stop, and there's there's no pace there. There's no style there. Because I mean, it's like it's like it's like a pedigree. When when I mm -hmm. when I go to a when I go to a competition, I don't study pedigrees. I look at the dog, and if I like that dog or that bitch, then I look at the pedigree, right? Because that that dog or that bitch is saying, "Woof, that's what I want." It's wagging its tail, it's spinning on the whistle, it's mm -hmm. doing its job, but it's doing it and it loves it and it's working with the handler. And I, I think that that's the key. A lot of people now are getting the dogs to do what they want, but they they don't give me that, you know. And you, right. you can you, you can see it in the field, you see it in the championship. You can see it in, in normal training. The flat, the, the tails are under the legs. I mean, t that tail is a huge benefit to a dog. When that's wagging and, and he's spinning on the whistle and the tail's going, he's taking a line. Mm -hmm. But the dog has to trust you and it has to trust your training. Mm -hmm. And it's not always so easy. But how do you pair it? Because, I mean, I've done it with my dog. I'm just wondering in, in gun dog stuff, is there a difference? Because you have to correct the dog, but in my, my, my philosophy is always, if I'm gonna correct the dog, I've got enough deposits in his piggy bank where he knows I love him, he knows I, he trusts yeah. me, he knows everything is safe, that if I give him that firm correction, like, no, pay attention, that he goes, okay, I'm sorry, you've been so good to me so far, this is just a one, this is an interim thing, this is just happening mm -hmm. to set me back. Um, is that something you look at in your training with the dogs as well? Yeah, I think, what, what I like to do, let's say a dog's gone off the whistle. Mm -hmm. Like I was out, out the other day and the wind was, was howling on this big bank and on the fire bank, what, a young dog went off the whistle. But I th a lot of people will then go out to the dog but say mm -hmm. nothing. So to me, that dog's had, I mean, where we were, probably had a, had a minute of doing well, what he wants on his own, completely right. out of control. I, I like to verbally cuss him. So all the way mm -hmm. out across that valley, like, hey! I'm coming. You really look at me, you know, and, right. and I want him to see that look at me. So mm -hmm. I'm putting him under pressure, but once I get to him, I, and then there's no pressure on him. And then, and then I said, the pressure is me coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the essence is, is you, you go every time. Yep. Not once in a blue moon, not once when you're really mad, not once when right. you're embarrassed, you know, yep. you go, you go, mm -hmm. you go. And like we did, we did then. This was in a big valley, so it was hard work getting there. So the sure. exercise is <laughs> yeah. we did on the flat. We, yep. we reproduced the same thing, so but where we could get to him a bit quicker. Mm -hmm. we, we we used the wind, pushed him into the wind to make it difficult with the whistle. So so, so thinking in, in in front, say next time you go off the whistle, I'll be see that a little bit closer. But mm -hmm. I think that's the key to it: is being hundred percent honest and get out to them dogs on a regular basis, not every now and again. Especially uh, that's, the yeah. you, you know, I think what you're saying there kind of relates to what I talk about a lot to people. 
I have a problem with people when they don't correct the dog when they're making a mistake. If they're making even a small no. mistake, I want to correct it. And I'm going to correct yeah. it as they're doing it, not after they do it, right? If you want to catch them in the act while they're doing hey, no, knock it off, because that's going to stop them later. Because if it's too late, it's really, it's not a correction. And if you think they're going to correct themselves and going to fix it, you're usually yeah. wrong, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and, exactly. And it's interesting you say, I mean, again, looking at, anybody can look at you look you up online and, and see your dogs working and how happy they work and how successful obviously you are with your with your track record um that you know that that building that structure in and giving that dog that fair information makes a happy dog makes a dog succeeding mm. oh yeah. yeah 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 you're quite right and does that then carry through that when, let's say you've 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 built the structure, you've, and again, I, I, I'm not, when I'm talking about corrections, I want to be really clear. We all know that we teach the dog, teach the dog, teach the dog without correcting by teaching him what we want. And then when we know he knows it, that's first when corrections come in. We don't correct dogs while we're teaching yeah. them, right? Exactly. I want to be, yeah. yeah. Because yeah, some people, gotta, animal rights people will take that off the, you know, uh, uh, totally out of context. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, corrections, I think, are super important, but we, we condition the puppy to learning things. And when we're clear he knows it, then I put corrections in whenever I need to. And like, I like what you said, every single time, so that the dog yeah. doesn't wonder, oh, am I going to get correct for the seven at that time? Not, yeah, yeah. But then that carries over to your trialing, right? So if you're in a trial, you're at the IGL, and you're how far will you walk hypothetically with the four dogs when you're in that front line? How far or how long will you go at a clip before you're done, like before you, the next group of four dogs walks up? Yeah. I mean, you, you could be lucky. You could go in as number one or number four in the, in the first batch of dogs, and you may get a retrieve in 20 yards. Okay. The next dog might get one. You could, so if you're lucky, you could be in and out in two minutes, or you could be in there for two hours. The four dogs up front could be going for four hours before you get one Poss retrieve? Possibly. It, you know, I've been to, I mean, you know, pro probably not at the IGL because, you know, there would, there would be game, but we've right. all been to trials where you've been in line for two hours and not had a retrieve. Yeah. So the, the, dog, the dog's off the lead, all that pressure, all that tension, you can't speak to him if he, if he moves. And I think longer they're in there without a retrieve, more wound yeah. up they get. You know, <laughs> sure. So, you know. Well, wow, that's, you, that's incredible. You can literally walk in for hours sometimes. Now, you're saying you can't talk to him, so you can't tell him heal, sit, wait, get back, or slow, whatever? No. No, no tapping your leg. What would you take Nothing. that lead off? You, know, you can that's say it. heal once you know, that's it. The next time you, you give your dog a command, there's only a verbal command when you're handling him. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Okay. Yeah. And then when he brings the, then he brings the game back. Right, mm -hmm. and then the next dog goes, but you'll still stay there till all four dogs finish the the, the series. No, no, okay. you'd have you have two, in the first round you have two retrieves. So okay. say number one had a retrieve, then number two had a retrieve, then number one would have another one. Then he'd go out of line. Number Got two it. would go, then number three, well, number five would then theoretically come in. Understood. So, but, but you could like a lot of the times, like in a normal trial games is usually at one side of the trial more than the other. So maybe okay. the right-hand side of the line could be up to number 10 and the, the, the left one still on two and three. So wow. they've watched all the birds, you know, just that, that's the beauty of walk to. You don't know. You, you have no idea what you're going to get, what you're not going to get. And that's why it's interesting. And, and the other dogs, they sit there and watch the other, your dog, because you'll say your dog's name to send them. And then the other dogs yeah. don't, don't move and don't go try to get no, the bird. Well, get not the bird. Supposed to. <laughs> <It's> not <laughs> does it? It probably happens, but it probably never happens like at IGL, does it? Oh yeah, I mean, do dogs will run in, dogs will squeak, dogs will damage birds. You know, yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah. When yeah. you're training for for this kind of a, a trial, what what are you doing? Are you using like wingers? Are you using like uh, live or not live, but like like. Um, dead game like you know or do you use bumpers or dokens or what's the training procedure to be honest with you, when it when it i use all those things during my training but mm -hmm. prior to a big big competition uh i like keep them on live game i mean i have a, a, my own little sheet where i put a, a few hundred partridge down 
and uh, I like to go out before a competition, a couple of us shoot a few birds and, and keep it natural, mm-hmm. you know. But I think uh, especially, you know, uh, an older dog, you, you get where your bumper boys and you get where your dummies and they don't really do nothing wrong. You, mm-hmm. They haven't got, they're not lifted. You take them into a, into a shooting scenario, into the field, a live game, mm-hmm. they, they come up a, up a gear or two. So, you know, I like, I like, keep them on live game all the way through the season if possible. You can't always do it. Sure. But certainly before the championship, I had a couple of days in Yorkshire, a couple of days in my own place on the way up to Scotland. So, you know, so you're preparing them all the way up on the real thing, on different terrain. And obviously, I mean, Cheshire's flat grassland. Scotland was like great, big, beautiful valley. So we wanted to travel and try and recreate the same terrain. Sure. Do you, do you notice that dogs... Um is it more of a genetic issue or, or a poor training issue if a dog is real chompy on the bird? Mm. Um, I think it's, I, w- I wouldn't say it was really genetic. It's, I think a lot of it comes through maybe poor, poor training or just excitement in, in, in some mm-hmm. dogs. And so, so you, you find some people will get all the dogs are excited. And then, mm-hmm. you know, some dogs will be a little bit boring. Some dogs will be just nice. But, you know, it, they, they should be living nicely to hand. And, and again, it's something you would work on in your training. Mm-hmm. But I think the ones that are a little bit excitable and fizzed up a little bit. And, of course, the, a lot of the handlers are very nervous. Sure. You know, and that all comes through. And the, the, the two connect, the two, put the two things together with the, the, the nerves of the dog and the excitement of the dog. And I think that's when they start playing with the birds a little bit. And that's really frowned upon, obviously, in in the field yeah. that you're doing, right? You get, you know, if he's mouthing birds, anything like if you see a, a dog mouthing a bird, as a judge, you'd be that little bit more critical if, if there's any damage, you know. Right. A dog and they will support. inspect it. Yeah, yeah. You you, you 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 take the the bird off the dog. You feel it, the bird, you know, its ribs on the side. His, his ribs should be nice and concave on both sides. Mm-hmm. But I mean, sometimes if they fall to, on a rock or uh-huh. on a fence or through a wood, that those ribs can be damaged. But if you've sure. got a dog mouthing them, sometimes it may not be mouthing them hard enough to damage them, but it just makes you, as a judge, thinking, well, I'll, I'll just be a little bit more vigilant with that dog. Is there a secret to getting a dog to have a more, not necessarily a soft mouth, but a steady mouth so that the dog doesn't mouth the bird? Because especially when the dog is running, now you have this excitement of the dog and the breathing and everything the dog is is, is mouth is obviously moving its mouth. Is there a secret to training yeah. that dog to keeping a softer mouth on the bird? Um, secret, I don't know. I mean, I've got, I've got a youngster now who does, who has, does a little bit of head movement. Like he's excited, you know, he's coming back with it. So, but I, I do I do different things to try and stop him. I think a lot of people stand still and try and take the bird off the dog. I, I, I'll maybe walk straight past him very quickly, ask him to walk to heel, and then all of a sudden they think, oh, oh, "What are you doing?" And that that breaks his concentration, and he, he'll come into heel, and I'll, I'll take take the bird off the dog as I'm walking. Mm-hmm. And the next time when he comes in, I might turn away and walk the complete opposite way and let him come to me. So I, I, every time, if I've got a dog that I feel is slightly like with a with a with a poor delivery or a bad head, you know that, that's what I'll do. So I'll break his concentration, make him make him look at me, and then I'll take the retrieve off him a little bit quicker, as opposed to try and sit there and come in because he sit there and the and the heads are going out there, and, you know. Yeah. So just make him think of something else. Mm, interesting. Interesting. Do do you, what do you think the judges are really looking for when they're judging? the everything from you know from the beginning to the the retrieve what are the dog the judges looking for in the dog like what catches their eye to make them like why is that one the champion and not that yeah. one yeah i think style and pace right yeah. but what does that look like yeah i like a dog that's got a really a long tail action but with speed wants to do it with you on the whistle you know and mm-hmm. then it, it can naturally do it on his own. Uh, as, mm-hmm. as a little bit like we said before with the dogs that are suppressed, you can see it a mile off. There's nothing nicer than seeing a dog at 200 yards, spinning on the whistle, wagging mm-hmm. that tail, 
working for you and himself, but enjoying it. That, that's what your judges are looking for. Yeah. You know, obviously, you want to see, see and hear a nice, quiet, calm handler. Mm-hmm. Some of them are very, go back, you know, some of the top of the voices go back <laughs> and the dogs only 40 yards away. Right. You know, so I think the combination of a quiet handler uh, and, and a stylish, pacey dog. Interesting. So the, the handler, how much of it do you think is the handler and how much of it do you think is the dog? Mm, a, a good a good dog with a with a good handler will win a lot more than a, a brilliant dog and a bad handler. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a combination of both, really. I mean, you you get certain people will have a dog in a lifetime, and they'll have dogs all the way through the career, and but that one dog suited them. And then you'll get a few handlers. You know, I always quote. Oh, oh, John Olsted, I said, when you've been to the championship 38 consecutive times, then call yourself a dogma. Mm-hmm. You know, like John, not had one dog in a lifetime and had a very right. good one. That them people can manufacture dogs but it, and, and do it correctly in a way we've just spoke. And, you know, all John's dogs all had tail action. They all were nice on the whistle and they were nice mm-hmm. to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, obviously, them, them people have an eye for it. What do you like suggest to people? Like, do you? I know you're. You've got some really something really exciting. I want to talk about in one second. But when you train people, like, do you do you private train people like to help them get ready for a competition, like yeah. coaching? Yeah. So what, yeah. What advice do you give to people? Like, is it hypothetically they already have a dog? They're coming to you. Tell me a little bit about that picture. Like, I come to you and I say, okay, Dave, please help me with my dog, um, and you know, we're going to work together. What are your little tips that really develop that relationship to get it in unison to work? I think as opposed to tips, I think because we're all unique and we're all different is Mm -hmm. as soon as I see somebody, I mean, what I call the setup is very important with a Labrador. And I think all your your top handlers have a good setup. And by the setup is how you send your dog. Okay. You know, it has to be the same, it has to be precise. I mean, I like to have both my feet together. I put my arm out on a mark, on a blind, on a memory, it doesn't matter. I, I do the same thing. I want the dog to be still for just one second so he takes me line before he goes. I mean, I have a, a lad who's been coming to me for about the last five or six years. And I, I watched him the first day, and just to try and make it interesting, I said, oh, look at this plane here coming. He said, what plane? I said, well, your arms are going like that. I said, he thinks he's on Manchester from an air- airport, you know, because <laughs> now I've, I've got him and I've calmed him down. He, he's got a setup and now he's a good lad. You know, mm. so he's gone from gone from a real, what I call a flapper, mm-hmm. to now, now I look at you and you, you're a dog trainer. So I think I, I, when I look at the people, and, and we're all different, that, sure. that, as opposed to tips, uh, you look at them and think, well, your feet are wrong, you're stepping in too late, mm-hmm. your dogs are not on the whistle, you know. Mm-hmm. So they, they tell you what, what you can actually see. And the thing is, you, you don't see it yourself, do you? Yeah, yeah, I can. That's a different, you know, the, the, the same lad the other day, when we were, we were giving him a go back on, on this big bank side, what, what, a 45 degree go back, where I, want, where I want the dog to go back and slightly right. Mm-hmm. He was good, but on his left hand, his hand was far too low and he was giving it basically a left and the dog was going left. Of course, then he's getting, then he's getting annoyed with his dog and I said, come here, this is what you're doing. The dog was actually doing it his own, but he didn't realise he was giving it the wrong command. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, but then the thing is you don't, you don't see yourself. You can't see yourself. Yeah. Well, that's why you always have to rely on somebody else to kind of tell you what, what the dog is seeing, right? Yeah, yeah. The picture. Well, yeah. When you think most, most top sports people, they all have a coach, don't they? Absolutely, your the best players, ones too. You know, your, your tennis players, your cricketers, they all got coaches, they all got yeah. someone. Your golfers, they've all got someone behind them tweaking the things like, you know. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever um, trained any other breed for the for hunting besides the Labradors? No, not really, no. I, I, mm-hmm. Just a, a little tiny few golden retrievers, but that, that's it, to be honest with you. It really is a sport for Labradors, right? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's, there's so much to do in the Labrador, you, you haven't got time to do anything else. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Do, do you own any other dogs? Do you have any other pets or no? No, no, just, just working labs. Just your working labs. And when, when, with your labs, do they live in the house with you? Do they live in a kennel? How, what's the relationship like on a day-to-day -day basis? To, to be fair, they're, they're more or less all, all in the kennel. Uh -huh. but, I mean... I only have a small kennel and we, we go out every day, take uh -huh. all the dogs with me. They all have a run in the morning. I'll, I'll train a few, take them out in the, in the afternoon. They'll have a run like, you know, so they, they, they're not locked away in kennels. They right. all have a, they have, a, have a great life, to be fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they get to go out and train with you every day? Yeah, uh, we go out every day, yeah. And we, of course, we go picking up in the season and, and to all the England competitions and one thing or another, like, you know, so. Yeah, so great. when you qualify for the IGL, because the IGL is not something everybody can go to. There's a strict qualification for that. Talk yeah. about that for a second, because I think people may not understand what's actually involved in actually getting invited to go to the IGL. Yeah. Well, first year, you have to win a novice trial. So, and, and these trials are open to uh, all England or Europe, whoever, whoever wants to come, they're open to the world, really, basically. So you win a novice. And that qualifies you to run into opens. And there's several ways you can get to the IGL, actually. At, at present, you can get there on three Bs or, or an A qualification. Now, an A qualification is if you come first in a two day open qualifier. So there's 24 dogs over two days. If you win that, that's an A qualification, and that's automatic qualification. Okay. If you come second in a in a two day, you get a B qualification. Or so you could you could theoretically come second three times and qualify. Or if you win a one day open twelve dog, that gives you a B. So you, well, that gives you, you a B. May, okay. So you could win three one days or win one 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 day and, and come second in a two day open. I think a dog that actually gets gets there on bees is although he may not have won but he's a good dog because he's a quite consistent dog mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think and i think this year was a bit of a record i think i think there's about six dogs that got there on bees which is very unusual wow mm. is six out of how many though out of the i think there was 67 dogs this year that qualified wow. for the championship yeah wow. a lot of dogs yeah yeah that's that's quite a quite a, quite a big one huh and that's over was it you said two or three days uh, the championship is three days. Three days. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it's a long time. And it's always in the winter, right? The IGL is always in the winter. Yeah. Okay. It's usually the first week in December. Right. Yeah. And then... Obviously, during the season. But you also do the game fair, right? Yeah, we do the game, three game fairs, yeah. And But the, the, the game fair is in the summer, right? Uh huh. Yeah, they're, they're slightly different, aren't they? They're, they're dummies. Mm. So oh, they're, they're dummies. Yeah, they're no, nothing to do with live game. They're out of season. Oh, okay. Uh, on your, so, you know, your, your canvas training dummies. Yep, yep, yep. So all everything in the game fair is with dummies. There's no live game. No live game at all. No. So, tell me a little bit about like the difference between taking because you've done both. Obviously, you're the captain of the team. Um, what's the difference for, let's start with the dog from the IGL in the winter, in this amazing terrain with live birds and hunting and all this, compare that to, to the game fair. Yeah. Completely different. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's not, not a lot of the dogs can be at the top of the tree on game and, and on dummies, you know, really? You, you, okay. Yeah. Not, so, some of them can. And then you, you'll get dogs like I'm really keen on game, and mm -hmm. and I bought on dummies. You see, so although they're stylish and can be, can win a trial and look brilliant, you take him to a working test where he knows he's a canvas dummy. Ooh, another one of those <laughs> things. I'm bored, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And then then you get on the other end, you get some dogs that are brilliant test dogs. Yep. For life and style, but you put them into a, into the shooting field, you can't hold them. Or they'll squeak or make noise because they'll, they'll lift too much, you see. Mm -hmm. So get, get a, a real good and they'll do both the top of the tree. I mean, like a dog like Ricky. Ricky's been top dog at the game fair. I was had a super run this year with the IGL uh, uh, diploma. Where it, 
he, he'll go as hard for a dummy as he will a pheasant. And there's no difference. You know, he's, that's why he's a, he's a joy to train at because it's the same every day. And Ricky's out of who? Ricky is out of a, a bitch called Greedy. Uh-huh. Uh, she she was a she was an international field trial champion bitch, um, and Greedy was a really hard going bitch, mm-hmm. really stylish bitch. She was out of Ragui, uh, out of a dog called Ragui's Travel. Travel was a okay. super dog, and the bit the, the on the sire side was a he was a French dog actually. Mm-hmm. International four trial champion enjoyed it the quarter. <laughs> I can't pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was he was an old, he was an old dog that had done a lot of winning, and that's uh-huh. what we were looking for when, when we bred that dog because Greedy was a was full of life. So wow. we wanted an old dog that we knew had been to the championship a few times. Had done very well from Belgium actually, uh-huh. and uh, so that was a, the reason why that mixture was there. Mm-hmm. As and, opposed to putting put to a young dog who you didn't know was right. it going to do a year trial, was it going to do two years trial, was it going to go over the top? So I know mm-hmm. the dog that's been there for four or five years, you have more of an idea if it's going to be level. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting because you don't really know on a dog what if you're breeding really young dogs what you're looking for when or what, what you're going to look at when they're five, six, seven, eight years old, right? No, it's quite yeah, it's quite true because. Usually, by the time a dog starting to produce good stuff, he's, he's, he's dead. Because yeah, it takes him. It takes him three, four years. You know, if you make him into a champion when he's four, then people mm-hmm. start to use him. Then, of course, yeah. the puppies have come through, and then he's at the end of his career. Sure. So, it's a very short career, really. Yeah, it's a real crapshoot. Yeah. How, yeah. How important, that's a, so. That's an interesting point. It's like with male dogs, we can collect them and we can keep keep them on ice for forever but Ooh. with the females we really don't have that that option how do you weigh that tricky balance to say okay this is a great male dog now i'm looking at a female but i don't really know much about her she's because at breeding age three two three four we really she hasn't really proven herself that much how do you select the female that you're going to really trust with this you know this male that you you really know as a producer well, that's true. Yeah, I mean, breeding is a very interesting part of it. Mm. Like, you know, I've just mated Meg. Now Meg's like five years old now. Mm-hmm. She's uh, she went to championship this year, and I decided to breed off her. She, she's proved herself, mm-hmm. and I think this is what people should be looking at when they buy puppies. Mm-hmm. And there's hundreds of bitches out there that have won nothing. I'm not saying the bad bitches, sure, but there's very very few that have proven themselves. Have mm-hmm. been in the field. They've competed regularly year in year out, you know, and gone to the championship. To me, you, you want to be getting or trying to get a puppy from that dog to a champion, as opposed uh-huh. just a champion dog to a, a bitch that's going to have a litter of puppies for make some money, some money. So yep. to, to me, looking for when I'm looking at pedigree, I want I want that bitch to have won. Mm-hmm. To me, that's very important. Then she's proved herself. Not she's not she's not just bred well. She also right. can do, yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. You, you you said something interesting too earlier in our conversation, where, you know, you look when you go to a trial, you're looking at the dog, and if you like the dog, then you look at the the, the the lines of the dog. You don't look at the lines of the dog and then decide, right? No, no, exactly. I, I like I like the dog to to catch me eye. Yeah. And then, then I'll go and look at the program and say, oh, it's by so-and-so's dog. And then I, mm-hmm. I may go to another trial a few weeks later, look at yeah. a dog. And then if, if a trend comes where it's the same dog, then I think, mm-hmm. oh, right, like that. Then it, you're telling me something. Right. As opposed to just, just studying paper. Yeah. You know, the, the paper at the end of the day doesn't do the work, does it? Sure. That's very true. That's very, very true. How much of it... When you when you look at that puppy, when you go go like what you said with which dog was it? Was it Mediterranean Blue, the one that you said crawled over the whelping box to be with you? Yeah, yeah, Mediterranean Blue. Yeah, that was him. Yeah. And now you're you said you're gonna you're breeding breeding him again, right? Yeah, yeah. I took some semen off um, Mediterranean Blue before he died. It must be about twelve or fifteen years ago now. Mm-hmm. And uh, my whole idea was wait till everything had disappeared. 
And I don't mm. think there's anything left now by Blue. So uh, Louise has got a really super stylish bitch called mm. Cher. I call it I call it racing snake. Actually, it's 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 really quick. <laughs> it's uh-huh. as quick as a lobby you'll ever see. Wow. It's, it's quiet. It's it's won a trial this year, first time out. You know, it, to me, that bitch has got everything. It's got pace. It's got style. It hits cover. It hits water, and that put to blue. Blue was I was called blue. Me seventy mile an hour though. Wow. He was very. He was very consistent. Very reliable. He was quite often the first three. Didn't have a lot of competitions because he, he was he was consistent. Mm-hmm. Now, to me, that that on paper should be a nice mix. You put in a, a firecracker, so a really yeah. steady. Good, Let's hope we get something in yeah. between. So we, yeah. we we obviously artificially inseminated her a couple of weeks ago. We actually go tomorrow to see if she's in pup, so that'll be exciting. Oh, okay, so you're checking the ultrasounds tomorrow? Yeah, exactly, okay. yeah. All right, well, I'm, hope, I'm hoping you're going to get something really nice there. Now, oh, you'll yeah. keep one of those pups? Yeah, oh, yeah. I shall keep, if, if there's a red dog in there like blue, I shall keep, keep one of them, I think. Right. You, you, do you like the red ones? Yeah, as, as long as they aren't too dark. Oh, okay. I don't like them too, I don't like them too dark, actually, but blue, blue is like one of the very early reds, actually. I think mm. so. It's a beautiful yeah, color. It. Are you yeah, partial to any, any of the colors? I mean, do, do you look at one and say, I'd lo- I, do you prefer blacks over yellows or reds? Or I've got quite a lot of yellows early on in my career. Mm-hmm. And then, so I think I will I'll opt for a yellow one this time, I think. Yeah, you can guarantee yeah. all the black, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> right, that's always the case, right? Whatever you yeah, want. Yeah, exactly. I'm just curious because you said something about you know qualifying for the IG on this kind of just popped in my head now. How common is it for someone from another country? I mean, I'm sure like you know England, Scotland, whatever they're there, but like from somebody from the United States or from France or from wherever to qualify for the IGL, does it ever happen? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think there's, there's, there's more and more uh, Europeans now spending a lot of time in England. Ah, uh-huh. okay. You know, the, some, some will come over for the whole season. They'll be over in August till, till, till the championship. Oh, wow. So there was three, uh, three or four this year. I was in more. Two, only two, was it? The, the two or three Euro- Europeans. Yeah, Marley, yeah, yeah. yourself, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, I think there's, there's, there's more people actually qualifying now than they did years ago. Hmm. But never in America, could, right? Uh, no, no one I'm qualified. Never. Yeah, no passes for America. He, he actually oh. qualified with Andy. He he was a dog that I had. He, he, he came, he, he ran him for, for Mr. Freakin professionally. So he, oh, I wow. think he was the first American, actually. He, and he did very well with him. Wow. Very, very interesting. Well, yeah, cool. but, uh, so one thing I want to touch on, because we talked about this off the air before we started, um, you're going to start, and I, I pushed you on this when we first talked, um, to do some online kind of mentoring, training, and, and presence for yourself. Yeah, yeah. I think well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to join up with Gundog TV and uh, mm-hmm. start doing a, a few little videos on a, on a weekly basis. So that would mm-hmm. be something interesting to look forward to. Yeah. Now, is that going to be something where people can subscribe monthly or buy a course or yeah. something like that from you? Yeah, I think, I think it's just subscribe monthly and each, each week there'll be two, two new videos coming out. Ah, uh-huh. okay. So, but there'll be no, I'm not going to do it like eight weeks old to a, a, a two year old right. fully trained dog. It'll be, it's just going to be what Dave Latham does on a normal day. Yeah, that's and that's that, super fun, right? Yeah. I mean, that's great. Yeah, if I'm going out rabbiting, there'll be a little bit of that. If I'm with a puppy, there'll be a little bit of that. If I'm building a pheasant pen, there'll be a little bit of that, you know, so. Oh, that's great, yeah. Everything, be, everything that we do on a normal mm. basis, be, and, you know, I let people let people see and yeah. show them the training ground we have, the methods we have and how we do it. So it should be quite an interesting project. Looking forward to it. So when do, when do you think that will launch? Be a, a couple of months, I think. Okay. Yeah, we need to just, just starting to do a bit of filming now. Okay. When it, when it stops raining in England. <laughs> if. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, mean, you gotta, I mean, you train in the rain, right? 
Yeah, yeah, we go out most days, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. I think so many people who live, especially in Southern California, the rain is like, you know, and I'm not just talking about, uh, you know, hunting stuff, but most other trainers, once it's raining, that's it. They put the dog inside, and that's, they're not going to go out. And that, I think it's such a bad thing. So you'd never get one trained in England, would you? <laughs> I would guess you wouldn't, yeah. <laughs> you'd never get anywhere. You'd never get anywhere. But th- so, so that's good to know. And will you do things like a Q&A, like maybe do like a little YouTube live for people that can then click in there? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great, great, great idea, like you mentioned. Yeah, like every now and again, we, we could do that, get some you people should. involved and let, uh, live and let them ask questions, you know, problems. Yeah. And, yeah, could I, it would be nice. I mean, I think so many people could benefit from your knowledge of, you know, just sitting down and, I mean, I do it every once in a while. I do, you know, a couple of, a month and just do live Q and A's and people can just type yeah. a question and then I'll answer it for them. And I, yeah, I guess, it's a great, great idea. idea. Yeah. yeah. Be lots of little problems people got out there that, you know, that you can just solve with a bit of luck. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think the important part, you know, for, for people to really understand that, you know. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, um, I, I want to continue our conversation. I always think of things that I want to ask you after we get off the air, but it's because your, 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 your methodology or your, your approach to it is very pure. And I think that's, that's hard to see. It's not contrived. It's not textbook. It's very natural. And even just talking to you and, and hearing what you're saying, it makes me feel like, you know, it's just such a, a natural thing. Do you, do you, when you, when you start getting into dog training, did you feel like, this just fits like it's like a comfortable pair of shoes or was it something you kind of worked your way into? No, I think, I think you're dead right. I mean, sometimes people say to me, well, who showed you how to do that? And I think, mm-hmm. well, I think, well, well, it just comes. I don't know. I mean, so sometimes I, ch- I change things to do. I think, why well, have I never thought of that before? Right. But it, it is. I mean, I always, I always quote what my dad said, used to say to me and I say to people, he says, Find out what you're good at, lad, and make it pay. And yeah, it's just something I enjoy, which is a which is a, a big thing. And mm-hmm. maybe I'm not quite too bad at it, but you know, but yeah, I think it, it is born in you. You know yourself when you take people out training. I, mean, I, mm-hmm. I took a lad called Ian Glaister out years ago, and he was a natural. You know, straight away it, I could feel he could take it on board. He was he listened, and he he had a couple of really good dogs. But other people. You can talk to them until the, the cows come home. It's never going to sink in, you know. So you see, right. it's like anything else. It's a gift, isn't it? For yeah. Footballers. And if you're with the right people, like a, a talented coach, like, you know, your yeah. Man City coach at the moment, he's got a, a group of super talented people with a coach like that, you're going to take some beating. Yeah. You still need that basic talent, don't you? you, you yeah. Know, and I think you've got your ball with that. Yeah. What, what does that look like for you when you go, like, like one of your training sessions, because I want to kind of paint the picture, because you're saying you're going to post these videos now, people can join up online and watch you go, which, I, which by the way, Dave, that's, that's a brilliant idea, to just watch you in your natural element. Hey, here I am getting my jacket on, we're going to go out mm. and we're going to train our dog. Yeah. Yeah. What is that's that exactly like? how we do it. And, yeah. and I'm telling you, I think, I think that's a winning idea, because that's what people need to see. They don't need to see this staged production of this this and these edits and everything no. fancy i want to see no. behind the scene i want to i want to be a fly on the wall and i want to kind of buzz around behind you from the minute you walk out your door you get your dogs you walk on the field just just run me through that in wrapping this great conversation up like what does that look like you're 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 heading out we're i'm, I'm coming over we're going to go train together what am i going to see right yeah yeah i mean First thing is, obviously, you get to your training ground, simple thing like just giving your dogs a quick run, empty your dog out. Mm-hmm. You know, some people straight out, straight out of the car and the dogs are having pee and poo and, you know, em- empty your dog, let, you, let your dog be, be, be completely empty before you take him out training. And then a, a lot of it will be what, obviously, what age the dog is, you know, what, what's yeah. it up to. And I... If I'm taking a person out on a one-to-one, I, I like to take a dog out at a similar age because I always try and tell people that, you know, I'm not – we can all make people look stupid. We can all put things on they can't do. But to me, I want to, I want to show you that I can do it. it mm-hmm. It's not stupid. It's doable, you know. And I think I think people actually learn more by watching than me just sitting and telling them. Yeah, 100%. 
I'll, I'll, if, if we're doing like, a, say we're doing a, a hunting exercise mm-hmm. and moving from a hunting exercise to a memory, I'll go around, I'll, I'll show exactly first, put some scent down in an area with a few tennis balls, put a memory out on the on the bank near a tree, with a, and, you know, explain to like where they want a focus point so that dog's going to run and, and, and do 40, 50 yards and, and go it, not from 10 yards and stop. You, 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 you want him to to really remember where that memory was. And, I, and I'll show him exactly how I would do it with one of my dogs, be it good or be it bad. And again, if it doesn't work, then they can see how I correct them. Mm-hmm. See how, 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 how I'll put it right again. Right. And then let them have a go. And it's much easier. It's like yourself, isn't it? If you read a manual to where if something goes wrong on your car, all the information's there, but mm-hmm. you watch a mechanic do it and then you come do it yourself. It's, it's sure. such easier, isn't it? Uh, that that's a basic thing I like to work on if I can. I see, I see. And and do, with your dogs, are you going out? Like, how long will you train your dogs for? You, you're going to take all your dogs out at the same time, right? They're all going to come with you, and then you'll be out in the training grounds. How long will you train yeah. one dog for? Yeah, just just depends. I mean, I would only only I only like to take one dog at a time. Sure. You know, uh, I'll, I'll take several dogs out prior to the grouse season, where I know I've got a walk with four or five dogs and they're going to be out all day. So then I'll, I'll practice, they, they've got, one's got to stay while I work the other. Yep. But as a young dog, when you teach a young dog, I always keep them on their own. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, it's far better. So they're all in the in the trailer until you, and one works at a time is what you're saying, right? Well, that's it, yeah. yeah. They'll all have a blast in the morning and then they'll have it, then they'll be in the trailer. But I think if you're, with like an open dog prior, say to a competition, you can really only train two a day. And mm. I, I, because of the thing with a Labrador, he's got to do nothing well. And I think that's what a lot of people forget. He's got to sit and wait for them 23 dogs to have a retreat. And if he can't sit there and do nothing and be quiet, he's no good. He can forget about, oh, your fancy 200 yard retrieves. He's got to wait, any he? Got to sit there, be quiet. No noise, no whining, no moving. Yeah. So you, you can't just do them as quick as you can with the spaniel. I know a lot of spaniel lads can be about 15, 20 minutes, they're in. But them yeah. labs need two or three hours, especially when you're getting towards the end. First, a, a younger one, I can probably go out and do them in an hour. Mm-hmm. But what I, I like to do on my training ground is, is set a course up. Like I'll put my bumper boys out. As I've got a lovely valley with jumps and fences and all that. So mm. I'll set, put a bang box out, I'll put some blinds out, I'll put some memories out, I'll put some marks out. It'll take me probably 35, 40 minutes to set it up, but then I can go around and do a few dogs. And, okay. and that's how I like, what I like to do with my clients, like, you know, we walk around, if it goes wrong, we can do it again and, and try and keep it interested. Yeah. Do you, do you work? Do you have somebody help you out there when you're doing it? Do you ever go out by yourself and do it or no? Yeah, a lot of time on my own. I, mean, I yeah. spend a lot of time with Louise. We go out, you know, if we haven't got anybody with us, we'll, we'll go out every day. Uh, if I've got a team of six people, I'll have a couple of helpers. Great. I want, I really, I'm super excited to see this. I want, I'm going to sign up as soon as you get it because. I think it's a great idea. And I think, you know, Janet's going to love it because she's a big fan of yours. And um, like I said, Dwayne is out of your out of your kennel, um, out of one out of one of your dogs, I should say, and and he's he's a great dog, and oh, out of Bailey, yeah, yeah, out of Bailey, yeah, and um, it's it's a really interesting sport. I think more Americans should really kind of look at the style of the the field trials you guys run in England because I think they're very very different from the American ones, especially the American field trials tend to be. I mean, I think they're kind of harder on the dogs. I think yours is more poetically in line with the breed, but uh, it's it's beautiful to watch. Yeah, I always say it. it, it the trial is a brilliant thing. You know, what what right. what walks up to the trial is really interesting. Well, I keep promising Janet we're going to go one year, so hopefully the next year we'll go, or this year at the end of the year. Yeah, yeah get yourselves over. So we'll go watch a, a, a nice a, a nice grouse trial on the moors. It'll be brilliant. Yeah, oh, we'd really love to do that. So, well, I'm gonna put the links to you know, with the video will be up before this, uh, before the Gun Dog TV stuff comes out. But we'll put that under there once it's available. And let's get back on the phone and talk again about all the stuff that you've got coming up. 
Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah, I always enjoy chatting with you. Yeah, but it, it's been nice. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Yeah. So we've covered a few interesting topics. Yeah, always. So, all right. Well, I'm going to put a link to um, what? What are you? Are you on Instagram or Facebook? Anything yet? Or uh, I know you've... just just I'm on Facebook, but not Instagram. Okay. Okay, Facebook. Yeah, well, I'll put a link to that down so people can follow you there and uh, get more information about all your stuff and your your um, your trainings. Yeah, good. All right, I'm gonna. I'll wrap it up on that. And uh, always good chatting with you. Yeah, you take care, Robert. See you soon. All right.